Section 108 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World's Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 108. An Incense Party by Sir Edwin Arnold. There is a pretty and refined form of social amusement in Japan, which has never been mentioned on this side, so far as I have seen, in connection with the domestic life of that country. It well deserves description, nevertheless, being so characteristic of the highly cultured tastes of the Japanese, and because it opens the gate into quite a new realm of sense-pleasure, and might indeed be very well introduced among people of education and fine sensibilities in England. It is founded upon the eastern love of sweet odors, a province of rare delight, far too much neglected among ourselves, as may be seen indeed by our lack of words with which to define different fragrances, and the foolish fashion which has surrendered the beautiful world of perfume almost entirely to the female sex. English men, it is true, wear buttonholes of violets or gardenias or rosebuds, and some of them are bold enough to bedew a pocket-handkerchief with a little frangipani or eau de cologne. But the habit is regarded as rather effeminate, and even ladies are a little blamed if they indulge in the stronger fragrances of the fashionable perfumers. All this is deplorable, and due, it seems to me, to a deficient olfactory gift, rather than to any reasonable prejudice. For why should we not take delight in the infinite range and exquisite variation of those mysterious odors, which, not content with scattering freely among her flowers, nature bestows upon us in many a strange and subtle corner of the animal and vegetable world. We have, by reason of our dullness, very few satisfactory titles in the dictionary with which to name these wonderful essences, and the nose, that most important feature, not only boasts no classic passages of its own to compare with the literature of the eye, the ear, and the lips, or even the hair, but is scarcely ever mentioned, even in poetry. Marshall can find nothing better to say of that organ in his mistress except that it is not too great, and all that Ariosto permits himself to observe about the same part of the lovely countenance of one of his chief heroines is that it stood in the middle of her face. They do not so disregard the nose in Japan, or neglect the delicious kingdom of sensations of which it is the well-provided and happy channel. Less fortunate than we are in the variety and delicacy of manufactured perfumes, they appreciate intensely those which they possess, and give lovely and appropriate names to distinguish one odor from the other. For the most part, Japanese perfumes are prepared not in the liquid form, as with us, but in powder or solid shape, necessitating the use of incense burners to develop the aroma of each. The Japanese word for an incense burner is koro, and upon this omnipresent article of Japanese domestic and religious life, the artists of the land have lavished their finest skill, the most divinely graceful utensils exist in bronze, iron, silver, gold, and pottery, entirely devoted as kogo, in which to keep the little tablets of incense, or as koro, and chojiburo, in which to burn them. Some are quaintly fashioned in the forms of fish, birds, or animals, and richly gilded. But the majority are of bronze, the fragrant smoke issuing from the perforations in the lid of the little vessel. Imagine yourself, then, O oh gentle English guest, seeking in vain for some new social pastime. Imagine yourself in Tokyo receiving the distinction of O Maneki, the honorable invitation, to a Joshuko, or incense party. I must call it a distinction, because these entertainments are only given in the upper circles of Japanese life, and would never be addressed to anyone who is not known as a person of quiet ways and cultivated tastes. On the highly ornamental document inviting you, or in a letter accompanying it, will be conveyed in graceful words the request that, if it be honorably convenient, you will not smoke, or drink tea, or sake, or eat scented sweetmeats for a day or so previous to the reception. It will also be in good form that you should not make any employment of pomade or oil for the hair, nor use any ordinary perfume. On repairing to the house of your hostess, for a lady always presides over this most dainty amusement, it will be polite and proper to enter with much caution the apartment reserved taking care to open and shut the paper shutters, shoji, very quietly, in order not to disturb the tranquil air of the room. Like all Japanese rooms, 
that chamber will be celestially clean and sweet, but the probability is that you are entering a yashiki, or superior abode, where, beside the cream-white tatami and the silvery shoji, the woodwork around will be of finished workmanship, and the supporting columns of natural timber, the most valuable that the mountain forests can yield. With your feet bare, or in socks, you have knelt down in your place within a half-circle of pleasant friends, male and female, who salute you with soft words of welcome and polished compliments. Your dress will be new, or at least unsoiled, all upper garments being left outside, that no smell of the street may enter this paradise of perfume. Opposite to the half-circle of happy guests kneels the fair hostess, in front of her being ranged a row of ten small packets of perfume, folded and tied in precisely an identical fashion, and their contents known to her alone, either by their arrangement or some private mark. Two or more incense burners will be near her, with a metal bowl of lighted charcoal and various little implements with which to handle the incense. In Joshuko, there will be ten packets, but only four different scents, and a specimen of each of these four is placed, distinctively colored or packed, at the left hand of the lady of the house. Let us say that they are the sorts called Tamatsumi, in English, pile of jewels, Shibafune, ships of grass, Mumei, the unspeakable, and a fourth fragrance, which is not named or experimented with. In the row of ten, all looking identical, there will be three of number one, three of number two, three of number three, and one of the mysterious compound. The guests receive ten little tickets, bearing names corresponding to this division, three of number one, three of number two, three of number three, and one for the Kyaksama, or unknown perfume. In a box near at hand, there is a division for the tickets of each of those present, and now the graceful pastime is ready to commence. The lady of the house burns one of the extra parcels of number one, and all in turn sniff at the aroma, the name and character of which she indicates. Then, gently wafting aside the fragrant cloud, she gives her guests the flavor of number two, and afterwards, in due turn, that of number three, naming them all. But Kyakuko is, as I say, not burned. Now then, the delicate ordeal commences. The lady host opens one of the ten indistinguishable parcels and places it on the glowing scarlet ashes of the koro. The blue vapor issues from the perforated lid. Each guest, in turn of precedence, savors the smoke decorously three times, and then, making up his or her mind, secretly drops the ticket which is thought to agree with that particular odor. One after the other, the guests thus vote in silent ballot, not being allowed to give any hint as to their persuasion, but softly conversing of other things as the incense burner goes round. Another and another packet is selected and consumed, and again and again those present cast their votes, each dropping the tickets into his own division of the ballot box. Somewhere or other in the course of the play, the secret scent will come in, but it is remarkable how often it fails to be recognized, the eager guests expecting it before it has arrived. Moreover, in spite of the frequent use of the fan, each of the fragrances intermixes with each, and it is quite astonishing how keen the nostril needs to be to analyze and separate the fine differences of the various essences. At the close of the round, when all ten perfumes have been consumed in the coro, a scrutiny is held of the voting, and he or she who has made the highest number of happy guesses receives a little hobi, a prize of some pretty and useful kind. A great collection of elaborate articles is needed to carry out this graceful entertainment in perfection. The incense burner ought naturally to be very artistic, whether of porcelain, bronze, copper, or iron. The incense box should be of fine lacquer and of beautiful shape and finish. It will generally have been constructed in three divisions, the first containing the incense cakes, the second some aloes wood, and the third a receptacle for the incense ashes. Little plates of mica must be ready, on which to lay the pieces of incense when put over the burner. The card box ought to be charming, and the cards are sometimes little lacquered wooden blocks, with a number on one side, and on the other the picture of some tree or flower, the name of which each guest will for the time being assume. Every person, it will be understood, receives ten tickets, with the same picture on the back, representing unmistakably the owner. 
It would take me too far to go into the varieties of incense and other fragrant materials which are manufactured by the Japanese perfumer, and to quote all the playful and fanciful names given to them. There is, for example, Kokon, the breath of twilight, and there is Yama Jino Tsuyo, the dew on the mountain path. The first is compounded of aloes wood, sandalwood, and kako in certain proportions. The second has clover blossom in it, and musk or jocko, of which the ladies of Dai Nippon are very fond. Some of them have the custom of sewing a tiny bag of musk dust inside a velvet fillet and fastening it under their sleeve upon the upper arm. The ingredients of these perfumes are mixed in powder and then kneaded into consistency with white honey. There are many other forms of this delicate entertainment besides Joshuko, such as Kogusako, Kebako, Kagetsuko, Meishoko, all of them having some amusing or imaginative significance. But enough has been said to show the refinement, the charm, and the entertaining character of this Japanese form of indoor pastime, which might, I think, be happily introduced into those fortunate abodes in our own land where there reigns something like Japanese tranquility and something like the Japanese artistic instinct, which can find true joy in the curve of a line, in the contrast of supplementary colors, or in the subtle difference of one sweet odor from another closely resembling it. End of section 108. This recording is in the public domain. Section 109 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 109, The Japanese House, by Basil Hall Chamberlain. The ordinary Japanese house is a light framework structure whose thatched, shingled, or tiled roof, very heavy in proportion, is supported on stones with slightly hollowed tops, resting on the surface of the soil. There is no foundation, as that word is understood by our architects. The house stands on the ground, not partly in it. Singularity number two, there are no walls, at least no continuous walls. The side of the house, composed at night of wooden sliding doors, called a motto, is stowed away in boxes during the daytime. In summer, everything is thus open to the outside air. In winter, semi-transparent paper slides, called soji, replace the wooden sliding doors during the daytime. The rooms are divided from each other by opaque paper screens, called fusama, or karakemai, which run in grooves at the top and bottom. By taking out these sliding screens, several rooms can be turned into one. The floor of all the living rooms is covered with thick mats, made of rushes and perfectly fitted together, so as to leave no interstices. As these mats are always of the same size, six feet by three, it is usual to compute the area of a room by the number of its mats. Thus, you speak of a six-mat room, ten-mat room, etc. In the dwellings of the middle classes, rooms of eight, of six, and of four and a half mats are those oftenest met with. The kitchen and passages are not matted, but have a wooden floor, which is kept brightly polished. But the passages are few in a Japanese house, each room opening as a rule into the others on either side. When a house has a second story, this generally covers but a portion of the ground floor. The steps leading up to it resemble a ladder rather than a staircase. The best rooms in a Japanese house are almost invariably at the back, where also is the garden, and they face south so as to escape the northern blast in winter, and to get the benefit of the breeze in summer, which then always blows from the south. They generally have a recess or alcove ornamented with a painted or written scroll, kekikomo, and a vase of flowers. Furniture is conspicuous by its absence. There are no tables, no chairs, no washhand, stands, no pianoforte, none of those thousands and one things which we cannot do without. The necessity for bedstands is obviated by quilts which are brought in at night and laid down wherever may happen to be most convenient. No mahogany dining table is required in a family where each member is served separately on a little lacquer tray. Cupboards are, for the most part, openings in the wall, 
screened in by small paper slides, not separate, movable entities. Whatever treasures the family may possess are mostly stowed away in an adjacent building, known in the local English dialect as a go-down, that is, a fireproof storehouse with walls of mud or clay. These details will probably suggest a very uncomfortable sum total, and Japanese houses are supremely uncomfortable to ninety-nine. Europeans out of a hundred. Nothing to sit on, no fire but a brazier to warm oneself by, and yet abundant danger of fire to be burnt out by, no solidity, no privacy, the deafening clatter twice daily of the opening and shutting of the outer wooden slides, draughts insidiously pouring in through innumerable chinks and crannies, darkness whenever heavy rain makes it necessary to shut up one or more sides of the house. To these and to various other enormities Japanese houses must plead guilty. Two things chiefly are to be said on the other side. First, these houses are cheap, an essential point in a poor country. Secondly, the people who live in them do not share our European ideas with regard to comfort and discomfort. They do not miss fireplaces or stoves, never having realized the possibility of such elaborate arrangements for heating. They do not mind drafts, having been inured to them from infancy. In fact, an elderly diplomat, who during his sojourn in a Japanese hotel, spent well nigh his whole time in the vain endeavor to keep doors shut and chinks patched up, used to exclaim to us, Mais les Japonois adorant les courants d'air. Furthermore, the physicians who have studied Japanese dwelling houses from the point of view of hygiene give them a clean bill of health. End of section 109. This recording is in the public domain. Section 110 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America. Thinking Out a Garden by Mortimer Menpez. A Japanese gardener spends his whole life in studying his trade, and just as earnestly and just as comprehensively as a doctor would study medicine. I was once struck by seeing a little man sitting on a box outside a silk store on a bald spot of ground. For three consecutive days I saw this little man sitting on the same little box, forever smiling and knocking out the ash from his miniature pipe. All day long he sat there, never moving, never talking. He seemed to be doing nothing but smoking and dreaming. On the third day I pointed this little man out to the merchant who owned the store, and asked what the little man was doing and why he sat there. He's thinking, said the merchant. Yes, but why must he think on that bald spot of ground? What is he going to do? I asked perplexed. The merchant gazed at me in astonishment, mingled with pity. Don't you know? he asked. He is one of our greatest landscape gardeners, and for three days he has been thinking out a garden for me. If you care to come here in a few days, he added, I will show you the drawings for that garden all completed. I came in a few days, and I was shown the most exquisite set of drawings that has ever been my good fortune to behold. What a garden it would be! There were full-grown trees, stepping stones, miniature bridges, ponds of goldfish, all presenting an appearance of vastness, yet in reality occupying an area the size of a small room. And not only was the garden itself planned out and designed, but it was also arranged to form a pattern in relation to the trees and the houses and the surrounding hills. This little old man, without stirring from his box or making a single note, had in those three days created this garden in his mind's eye, and on returning home had sketched out the final arrangement. The merchant told me that his garden would be completed in a few weeks, with full-grown trees flourishing in it, and everything planted, all but one stone which in all probability would be there in a few weeks, while, on the other hand, it might not be placed there for years. On inquiring as to the reason of this strange delay, I was told that one particular stone, though insignificant and unnoticeable in our eyes, occupies a very prominent position, and that upon the proper placing and quality of it, the beauty and perfection of a Japanese garden depend on it almost entirely. Sometimes hundreds and even thousands of dollars are paid for a large stone that happens to be rightly proportioned and of the correct texture of ruggedness to occupy a certain position in a Japanese garden. End of section 110
This recording is in the public domain. Section 111 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen. A Stone Gateway. Photograph, page 418. The Shinto shrines are exceedingly simple. They are built of wood, roofed with thatch, and are not made gorgeous by brilliant coloring. Before each shrine stands a gateway or archway made by laying a projecting horizontal bar on top of two upright posts. The bar was originally used as a resting place for fowls which were offered to the gods to give warning of the coming of day. Gradually this form of archway became a symbol of the religion, and countless numbers of them were erected. End of section 111. This recording is in the public domain. Section 112 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1. China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 112. An Artist in Flowers. By Mortimer Menpez. I feel that I must give a slight description of some of the marvelous creations in purple irises, lilies, and pines that the greatest master in Tokyo once arranged for me at my hotel. He arrived early one morning, and in great good humor, evidently feeling that I, being an artist, his work would be appreciated and understood. He carried with him his flowers, tenderly wrapped in a damp cloth under one arm, and his vases under another. One of his most promising pupils, a girl of nineteen, accompanied him, acting almost as a servant, and evidently worshipping him as a master. He began at once to show us a decoration of lilies and reeds. With the utmost rapidity he took out a bunch of slim reeds, pulled them to different lengths, the large ones at the back, the small ones in front, and caressed the whole into a wooden prong, looking like a clothes peg, and arranged it in a kind of vase made out of circular section of bamboo. An immense amount of work was taken with the handling of these reeds, the master drawing back now and then in a stooping position, with his hands on his knees and his eyes bolting out to view his handiwork critically. Next he took some lilies with their leaves and arranged them in a metal stand composed of a number of divisions looking like cartridge cases cut off. Every leaf was twisted and bent and cut to improve its form. The half-open lilies were made to look as though they were growing, and were a great favorite with this master because of the scope for beautiful curves and lines that they allowed. Time after time he would take out a leaf or a flower, putting another in its place, thereby showing that he had absolute command over his subject, and a fixed picture in his mind that he was determined to produce at any cost. The ultimate result of the decoration was perfect naturalness. I never saw lilies growing on the hillside look more natural than they did here, yet each had been twisted and bent into a set design laid down by the artist. Both reeds and lilies were placed in a wooden tray partially lacquered, the unlacquered portion representing the old worm-eaten wood. Pebbles were placed in the bottom of the tray, and the hole was flooded with water. Then he began his decoration of irises. He took a bundle of iris leaves, cut and trimmed them, washing and drying each leaf separately, and sticking them together in groups of twos and threes. 
with his finger and thumb he gently pressed each one down the centre rendering it as pliable as wire the leaves were cut to a point at the base and placed in a metal stand with consecutive circles then an iris bud with the purple just bursting was placed in position and caressed into bloom the whole was syringed with water and carefully placed in a corner of the room i have described these few flower arrangements in detail in order to show the exactitude of the work and the immense amount of care taken by professors in flower arrangement on this particular occasion i had invited some friends to enjoy the professor's masterpiece with me and he had just completed a most exquisite production by far the best and finest he had achieved that day it was an arrangement of pine with one great jutting bough perfectly balanced in fact a veritable work of art the professor was a true artist he loved his work and it was all the world to him for once he was content and had just leaned back to view his work through half-closed eyes when in a flash an oxford straw hat was clapped down right on top of it it was the husband of one of my friends just returned from a walk full of spirits and boisterously happy it was a cruel thing to do but he did not realize the horror of his act he saw a bough sticking right out of a pot and it seemed to him a suitable place to hang his hat on so he hung his there that was all the little assistant gave one frightened look at her master and began to pack up the utensils at once the professor drew himself up in a very dignified way bowed profoundly and left the hotel i never saw him again and i knew that i never should for he went away crushed end of section 112 this recording is in the public domain. Section 113 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Emma Charlotte. How a Japanese Paints by Mortimer Menpes. Kaiosai is the greatest of all living Japanese artists. The Editor. Kayosai next began to discuss drawing, and, as he was speaking to an Englishman, English drawing in particular. I hear that when artists in England are painting, he said, if they are painting a bird, they stand that bird up in their back garden, or in their studio, and begin to paint it at once. Then and there, never quite deciding what they are going to paint, never thinking of the particular pose and action of the bird that is to be represented on the canvas. Now, suppose that bird suddenly moves one leg up. What does the English artist do then? He could not understand how an English painter could paint with the model before him. I naturally told him that they copied what they saw that they got over the difficulty as best they could. I do not understand that, he said. In my own practice I look at the bird. I want to paint him as he is. He has got a pose. Good. Then he suddenly puts down his head, and there is another pose. The bare fact of the bird being there in an altered pose would compel me to alter my idea and so on, until at last I could paint nothing at all. I asked him what, then, was his method. I watch my bird, he replied, and the particular pose I wish to copy, before I attempt to represent it. I observe that very closely until he moves and the attitude is altered. Then I go away and record as much of that particular pose as I can remember. Perhaps I may be able to put down only three or four lines. But directly I have lost the impression I stop. Then I go back again and study that bird until it takes the same position as before. 
and then I again try and retain as much as I can of it. In this way I begin by spending a whole day in a garden watching a bird in its particular attitude. And in the end I have remembered the pose so well by continually trying to represent it, that I am able to repeat it entirely from my impression, but not from the bird. It is a hindrance to have the model before me when I have a mental note of the pose. What I do is a painting from memory, and it is a true impression. I have filled hundreds of sketchbooks, he continued, of different sorts of birds and fish and other things, and have at last got a facility, and have trained my memory to such an extent that by observing the rapid action of a bird I can nearly always retain and produce it. By a lifelong training I have made my memory so keen that I think I may say I can reproduce anything I have once seen. End of section 113. This recording is in the public domain. Section 114 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Avai. How to Talk Politely in Japan by Percival Lowell. You are, we will suppose, at a tea house and you wish for sugar. The following almost stereotyped conversation is pretty sure to take place. I translated literally, simply prefacing that every tea house girl, usually in the first blush of youth, is generally addressed as elder sister, another honorific, at least so considered in Japan. You clap your hands. Enter tea house maiden. You. Hi, elder sister. Augustly exists there sugar. The tea house maiden. The Honourable Sugar, Augustly, is it? You, so, Augustly. The Tea House Maiden, he? Indescribable expression of assent. Exit Tea House Maiden to fetch the sugar. Now the Augustlys go almost without saying, but why is the sugar honourable? Simply because it is eventually going to be offered to you. But she would have spoken of it by precisely the same respectful title if she had been obliged to inform you that there was none, in which case it never could have become yours. Such is politeness. We may note, in passing, that all her remarks and all yours, bearing your initial question, meant absolutely nothing. She understood you perfectly from the first, and you knew she did. But then, if all of us were to say only what were necessary, the delightful art of conversation would soon be nothing but a science. End of section 114. This recording is in the public domain. Section 115 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org. Japan, Part 4. The Awakening of Japan. Historical Note. In 1852, it was learned that some American seamen wrecked on the Japanese coast had been harshly treated. Commodore M. C. Perry was sent to protest and demand protection in such cases. He succeeded not only in this, but also in the making of a treaty, opening the country to commerce. Trade with other countries was soon allowed. The office of shogun was abolished in 1868. Full power was restored to the Mikado, and the old order of feudalism came to an end. Teachers, army officers, and engineers were invited from Europe and America to assist in the rebirth of Japan. Western laws were introduced, the nobility reorganized, a constitution granted, and in 1891 the first parliament met. These tremendous changes were not made without protest, however, 
and when the wearing of swords was forbidden, the samurai or military class of the province of Satsuma rose in an insurrection that cost 20,000 lives before it was subdued. In 1894, war with China broke out in regard to Korea. The result was the total defeat of China, the surrender of the island of Formosa to Japan, the payment of a large indemnity, and the independence of Korea. After the Boxer Uprising of 1899 in China, the Russians continued to occupy Manchuria, contrary to agreement. This, added to earlier causes of annoyance, led in 1904 to the Russo-Japanese War. Japan, by an unbroken series of victories, swept back the forces of Russia and destroyed her navy. By the Treaty of Peace signed at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in 1905, Japan obtained half of the island of Sakhalin, Port Arthur, and adjacent territory, and control of Korea. End of section 115. This recording is in the public domain. Section 116 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 116. When Commodore Perry landed in japan by francis l hawks compiled by francis l hawks from the notes and journals of commodore perry and his officers the expedition to japan which resulted in a treaty of peace between that country and the united states in eighteen fifty four was organized and commanded by commodore perry the editor as the atmosphere cleared and the shores were disclosed to view the steady labors of the japanese during the night were revealed in the showy effect on the uraga shore ornamental screens of cloth had been so arranged as to give a more distinct prominence as well as the appearance of greater size to the bastions and forts and two tents had been spread among the trees the screens were stretched tightly in the usual way upon posts of wood, and each interval between the hosts was thus distinctly marked, and had in the distance the appearance of panelling. Upon these seeming panels were emblazoned the imperial arms, alternating with the device of a scarlet flower bearing large heart-shaped leaves. Flags and streamers upon which were various designs represented in gay colors, hung from the several angles of the screens, while behind them thronged crowds of soldiers, arrayed in a costume which had not been before observed, and which was supposed to belong to high occasions only. The main portion of the dress was a species of frock of a dark color, with short skirts, the waists of which were gathered in with a sash and which was without sleeves, the arms of the wearers being bare. All on board the ships were alert from the earliest hour, making the necessary preparations. Steam was got up, and the anchors were weighed, that the ships might be moved to a position where their guns would command the place of reception. The sailing vessels, however, because of a calm, were unable to get into position. The officers, seamen, and marines who were to accompany the Commodore were selected, and as large a number of them mustered as could possibly be spared from the whole squadron. All, of course, were eager to bear a part in the ceremonies of the day, but all could not possibly go, as a sufficient number must be left to do ship's duty. Many of the officers and men were selected by lot, and when the full complement, 
which amounted to nearly three hundred, was filled up, each one busied himself in getting his person ready for the occasion. The officers, as had been ordered, were in full official dress, while the sailors and marines were in their naval and military uniforms of blue and white. Before eight bells in the morning watch had struck, the Susquehanna and Mississippi moved slowly down the bay. Simultaneously with this movement of our ships, six Japanese boats were observed to sail in the same direction, but more within the land. The government striped flag distinguished two of them, showing the presence on board of some high officials, while the others carried red banners, and were supposed to have on board a retinue or guard of soldiers. On doubling the headland which separated the former anchorage from the bay below, the preparations of the Japanese on the shore came suddenly into view. The land bordering the head of the bay was gay with a long stretch of painted screens of cloth, upon which was emblazoned the arms of the emperor. Nine tall standards stood in the center of an immense number of banners of divers lively colors which were arranged on either side until the whole formed a crescent of variously tinted flags which fluttered brightly in the rays of the morning sun from the tall standards were suspended broad pennons of rich scarlet which swept the ground with their flowing length on the beach in front of this display were ranged regiments of soldiers who stood in fixed order evidently arrayed to give an appearance of martial force that the americans might be duly impressed with the military power of the japanese as the beholder faced the bay he saw on the left of the village of gorihama a straggling group of peaked roof houses built between the beach and the base of the high ground which ran in green acclivities behind and descended from height to height to the distant mountains a luxuriant valley or gorge walled in with richly wooded hills opened at the head of the bay and breaking the uniformity of the curve of the shore gave a beautiful variety to the landscape on the right some hundred japanese boats or more were arranged in parallel lines along the margin of the shore with the red flag flying at the stern of each the whole effect though not startling was novel and cheerful and everything combined to give a pleasing aspect to the picture the day was bright with a clear sunlight which seemed to give fresh vitality alike to the verdant hillsides and the gay banners and the glittering soldiery back from the beach opposite the centre of the curved shore of the bay the building just constructed for the reception rose in three pyramidal-shaped roofs, high above the surrounding houses. It was covered in front by striped cloth, which was extended in screens to either side. It had a new, fresh look indicative of its recent erection, and, with its peaked summits, was not unlike, in the distance, a group of very large ricks of grain. Two boats approached as the steamers entered the opening of the bay and when the anchors were dropped they came alongside the susquehanna kayama yezaiman with his two interpreters came on board followed immediately by nagazima saboroska and an officer in attendance who had come in the second boat they were duly received at the gangway and conducted to seats on the quarter-deck all were dressed in full official costume somewhat different from their ordinary garments their gowns though of the usual shape were much more elaborately adorned the material was of a very rich silk brocade of gay colors turned up with yellow velvet and the whole dress was highly embroidered with gold lace in various figures upon which was conspicuously displayed on the back sleeves and breast the arms of the wearer a signal was now hoisted from the susquehanna as a summons for the boats from the other ships 
and in the course of half an hour they had all pulled alongside with their various officers sailors and marines detailed for the day's ceremonies the launches and cutters numbered no less than fifteen and presented quite an imposing array and with all on board then in proper uniform a picturesque effect was not wanting captain buchanan having taken his place in his barge led the way flanked on either side by the two japanese boats containing the governor and vice-governor of uraga with the respective suites and these dignitaries acted as masters of ceremony and pointed out the course to the american flotilla the rest of the ship's boats followed after in order with the cutters containing the two bands of the steamers who enlivened the occasion with their cheerful music the boats skimmed briskly over the smooth waters for such was the skill and consequent rapidity of the japanese scullers that our sturdy oarsmen were put to their metal to keep up with their guides when the boats had reached halfway to the shore the thirteen guns of the susquehanna began to boom away and re-echo among the hills this announced the departure of the commodore who stepping into his barge was rowed off to the land the guides in the japanese boats pointed to the landing place toward the centre of the curved shore where a temporary wharf had been built out from the beach by means of bags of sand and straw the advance boat soon touched the spot and captain buchanan who commanded the party sprang ashore being the first of the americans who landed in the kingdom of japan he was immediately followed by major zylan of the marines the rest of the boats now pulled in and disembarked their respective loads the marines one hundred marched up the wharf and formed into line on either side facing the sea then came the hundred sailors who were also ranged in rank and file as they advanced while the two bands brought up the rear the whole number of americans including sailors marines musicians and officers amounted to nearly three hundred no very formidable array but still quite enough for a peaceful occasion and composed of very rigorous able-bodied men who contrasted strongly with the smaller and more effeminate-looking japanese these latter had mustered in great force the amount of which the governor of uraga stated to be five thousand but seemingly they far outnumbered that their line extended around the whole circuit of the beach from the farther extremity of the village to the abrupt acclivity of the hill which bounded the bay on the northern side while an immense number of the soldiers thronged in behind and under cover of the cloth screens which stretched along the rear the loose order of this japanese army did not betoken any very great degree of discipline the soldiers were tolerably well armed and equipped their uniform was very much like the ordinary japanese dress their arms were swords spears and matchlocks these in front were all infantry archers and lancers but large bodies of cavalry were seen behind somewhat in the distance as if held in reserve the horses of these seemed of a fine breed hardy of good bottom and brisk in action and these troopers with their rich caparisons presented at least a showy cavalcade along the base of the rising ground which ascended behind the village and entirely in the rear of the soldiers was a large number of the inhabitants among whom there was quite an assemblage of women who gazed with intense curiosity through the openings in the line of the military upon the stranger visitors from another hemisphere on the arrival of the commodore his suite of officers formed a double line along the landing-place and as he passed up between them they fell into order behind him the procession was then formed and took up its march toward the house of reception the route to which was pointed out by kayama yazaimon and his interpreter 
who preceded the party the marines led the way and the sailors following the commodore was duly escorted up the beach the united states flag and the broad pennant were borne by two athletic seamen who had been selected from the crews of the squadron on account of their stalwart proportions two boys dressed for the ceremony preceded the commodore bearing an envelope of scarlet cloth the boxes which contained his credentials and the president's letter these documents of folio size were beautifully written on vellum and not folded but bound in blue silk velvet each seal attached by cords of interwoven gold and silk with pendant gold tassels was encased in a circular box six inches in diameter and three in depth wrought of pure gold each of the documents together with its seal was placed in a box of rosewood about a foot long with lock hinges and mountings all of gold on either side of the commodore marched a tall well-formed negro who armed to the teeth acted as his personal guard these blacks selected for the occasion were two of the best-looking fellows of their color that the squadron could furnish all this of course was but for effect the procession was obliged to make a somewhat circular movement to reach the entrance of the house of reception this gave a good opportunity for the display of the escort the building which was but a short distance from the landing was soon reached in front of the entrance were two small brass cannon which were old and apparently of european manufacture on either side were grouped a rather straggling company of japanese guards whose costume was different from that of the other soldiers those on the right were dressed in tunics gathered in at the waist with broad sashes and in full trousers of gray color the capacious width of which was drawn in at the knees while their heads were bound with a white cloth in the form of a turban they were armed with muskets upon which bayonets and flintlocks were observed the guards on the left were dressed in a rather dingy brown-colored uniform turned up with yellow and carried old-fashioned matchlocks the commodore having been escorted to the door of the house of reception entered with his suite the building showed marks of hasty erection and the timbers and boards of pine wood were numbered as if they had been fashioned previously and brought to the spot already to be put together the first portion of the structure entered was a kind of tent principally constructed of painted canvas upon which in various places the imperial arms were painted its area enclosed a space of nearly forty feet square beyond this entrance hall was an inner apartment to which a carpeted path led the floor of the outer room was generally covered with white cloth but through its centre passed a slip of red-coloured carpet which showed the direction to the interior chamber this latter was entirely carpeted with red cloth and was the state apartment of the building where the reception was to take place its floor was somewhat raised like a dais above the general level and was handsomely adorned for the occasion violet-colored hangings of silk and fine cotton with the imperial coat of arms embroidered in white hung from the walls which enclosed the inner room on three sides while the front was left open to the antechamber or outer room as the commodore and his suite ascended to the reception room the two dignitaries who were seated on the left arose and bowed and the commodore and suite were conducted to the armchairs which had been provided for them on the right the interpreters announced the names and titles of the high japanese functionaries as toda itsu no kami toda prince of itsu and ido owami no kami ido prince of iwami they were both men of advanced years the former apparently about fifty and the latter some ten or fifteen years older prince toda was the better-looking man of the two 
and the intellectual expression of his large forehead and amiable look of his regular features contrasted very favorably with the more wrinkled and contracted and less intelligent face of his associate the prince of iwami they were both very richly dressed their garments being of heavy silk brocade interwoven with elaborately wrought figures in gold and silver from the beginning the two princes had assumed an air of statuesque formality which they preserved during the whole interview as they never spoke a word and rose from their seats only at the entrance and exit of the commodore when they made a grave and formal bow Yitzaymon and his interpreters acted as masters of ceremony during the occasion on entering they took their positions at the upper end of the room kneeling down beside a large lacquered box of scarlet colour supported by feet gilt or brass for some time after the commodore and his suite had taken their seats there was a pause of some minutes not a word being uttered on either side tatsnoski the principal interpreter was the first to break silence which he did by asking mr portman the dutch interpreter whether the letters were ready for delivery and stating that the prince toda was prepared to receive them and that the scarlet box at the upper end of the room was prepared as the receptacle for them the commodore upon this being communicated to him beckoned to the boys who stood in the lower hall to advance when they immediately obeyed his summons and came forward bearing the handsome boxes which contained the president's letter and other documents the two stalwart negroes followed immediately in rear of the boys and marching up to the scarlet receptacle received the boxes from the hands of the bearers opened them took out the letters and displaying the writing and seals laid them upon the lid of the japanese box all in perfect silence the letter of the president millard fillmore expressed the kindly feelings of the united states toward japan and his desire that there should be friendship and trade between the two countries the documents were laid upon the scarlet box and a formal receipt was given for them yitzaiman and tatsnotsky now bowed and rising from their knees drew the fastenings around the scarlet box and informing the commodore's interpreter that there was nothing more to be done passed out of the apartment bowing to those on either side as they went the commodore now rose to take leave and as he departed the two princes still preserving absolute silence also arose and stood until the strangers had passed from their presence the commodore and his suite were detained a short time at the entrance of the building waiting for their barge whereupon yitzaiman and his interpreter returned and asked some of the party what they were waiting for to which they received the reply for the commodore's boat nothing further was said the whole interview had not occupied more than from twenty to thirty minutes and had been conducted with the greatest formality though with the most perfect courtesy in every respect the procession reformed as before and the commodore was escorted to his barge and embarking was rowed off toward his ship followed by the other american and the two japanese boats which contained the governor of uraga and his attendants the bands meanwhile playing our national airs with great spirit as the boats pulled off to the ships end of section 116 this recording is in the public domain section 117 of china japan and the islands of the pacific this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 1 China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific Edited by Ava March Tappan 
Section 117. The President's Letter by Townsend Harris. First American Envoy to Japan. I started for my audience about ten o'clock with the same escort as on my visit to the minister, but my guards all wore kamishimos and breeches which only covered half the thigh, leaving all the rest of the leg bare. My dress was a coat embroidered with gold after the pattern furnished by the State Department, blue pantaloons with a broad gold band running down each leg, cocked hat with gold tassels and a pearl-handled dress sword. Mr. Hoiskin's dress was the undress navy uniform, regulation sword, and cocked hat. We crossed the moat by a bridge that was about half a mile from my house. On arriving at the second moat, all were required to leave their norimonos except the Prince of Shinano and myself. When we arrived within about three hundred yards of the last bridge, Shinano also left his norimono, and our horses, his spears, etc., etc., with the ordinary attendants, all remain. I was carried up to the bridge itself, and, as they say, farther than any Japanese was ever carried before, and here I dismounted, giving the President's letter which I had brought in my norimono to Mr. Hoiskin to carry. We crossed this bridge, and at some one hundred and fifty or two hundred yards from the gate I entered the audience hall. Before entering here, however, I put on the new shoes I had worn on my visit to the minister, and the Japanese did not even ask me to go in my stocking feet. As I entered the vestibule, I was met by two officers of the household. We stopped, faced each other, and then bowed. Then they led me along a hall to a room where, on entering, I found the two chairs and a comfortable brazier. I should here note that tobacco is not served among the refreshments of the palace. I again drank the tea gruel. The breeches are the great feature of the dress. They are made of yellow silk, and the legs are some six to seven feet long. Consequently, when the wearer walks, they stream out behind him, and give him the appearance of walking on his knees, an illusion which is helped out by the short stature of the Japanese, and the great width over the shoulders of their kamishimos. The cap is also a great curiosity, and defies description. It is made of a black varnished material, and looks like a Scotch Kalmarna cap, which has been opened only some three inches wide, and is fantastically perched on the very apex of the head. The front comes just to the top edge of the forehead, but the back projects some distance behind the head. This extraordinary affair is kept in place by a light-colored silk cord, which passes over the top of the coronet, passes down over the temples, and is tied under the chin. A lashing runs horizontally across the forehead, and, being attached to the perpendicular cord, passes behind the head where it is tied. My friend Shinano was very anxious to have me enter the audience chamber and rehearse my part. This I declined as gently as I could, telling him that the general customs of all courts were so similar that I had no fear of making any mistakes, particularly as he had kindly explained their part of the ceremony, while my part was to be done after our western fashion. I really believe he was anxious that I should perform my part in such a manner as to make a favorable impression on those who would see me for the first time. I discovered also that I had purposely been brought to the palace a good hour before the time so that he might get through his rehearsal before the time for my actual audience. Finding I declined the rehearsal, I was again taken to the room that I first entered which was comfortably warm and had chairs to sit on tea was again served to me 
at last i was informed that the time had arrived for my audience and i passed down by the poor daimyos who were still seated like so many statues in the same place but when i had got as far as their front rank i passed in front of their line and halted on their right flank toward which i faced shinano here threw himself on his hands and knees i stood behind him and mr hoiskin was just behind me the audience chamber faced in the same manner as the room in which the great audience was seated but separated from it by the usual sliding doors so that although they could see me pass and hear all that was said at the audience they could not see into the chamber at length on a signal being made the prince of shinano began to crawl along on his hands and knees and when i half turned to the right and entered the audience chamber a chamberlain called out in a loud voice ambassador merrigan i halted about six feet from the door and bowed then proceeded nearly to the middle of the room where i again halted and bowed again proceeding i stopped about ten feet from the end of the room exactly opposite to the prince of bichu on my right hand where he and the other five members of the great council were prostrate on their faces on my left hand were three brothers of the tycoon prostrated in the same manner and all of them being end on towards me after a pause of a few seconds i addressed the tycoon as follows may it please your majesty in presenting my letters of credence from the president of the united states i am directed to express to your majesty the sincere wishes of the president for your health and happiness and for the prosperity of your dominions i consider it a great honor that i have been selected to fill the high and important place of plenipotentiary of the united states at the court of your majesty and as my earnest wishes are to unite the two countries more closely in the ties of enduring friendship my constant exertions shall be directed to the attainment of that happy end here i stopped and bowed after a short silence the tycoon began to jerk his head backward over his left shoulder at the same time stamping with his right foot this was repeated three or four times after this he spoke audibly and in a pleasant and firm voice that was interpreted as follows pleased with a letter sent with the ambassador from a far distant country and likewise pleased with his discourse intercourse shall be continued for ever mr hoiskin who had been standing at the door of the audience chamber now advanced with the president's letter bowing three times as he approached the minister for foreign affairs rose to his feet and stood by me i removed the silk cover over the box opened it and also raised the cover of the letter so that the minister could see the writing i then closed the box replaced the silk covering made of red and white stripes six and seven and handed the same to the minister who received it with both hands and placed it on a handsome lacquered stand which was placed a little above him he then lay down again and i turned towards the tycoon who gave me to understand my audience was at end by making me a courteous bow i bowed retreated backward halted bowed again and for the last time so ended my audience when i was reconducted to my original room and served with more tea gruel a good deal of negotiation had been used by the japanese to get me to eat a dinner at the palace alone or with mr hoiskin only this i declined doing i offered to partake of it provided one of the royal family or the prime minister would eat with me i was told that their customs forbade either from doing so 
I replied that the customs of my country forbade any one to eat in a house where the host or his representative did not sit down to table with him. At last the matter was arranged by ordering the dinner to be sent to my lodgings. End of section 117. This recording is in the public domain. Section 118 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Edited by Eva March Teppen. Section 118. The Schools of Old Japan. By Francis Ottiwell Adams. Secretary of the Legation at Yedo The Japanese lad began his education at the age of six or seven years. There were three grades of schools, Shō, Shiyu, and Daigaku, small, middle, and great school. In many of the daimyo's capitals the latter was wanting. The one in Yedo might with some show of propriety be called a university. The Japanese pupil took his first steps in learning by mastering the hiragana and katakana alphabet or syllabary he must know how to read and write both styles before he begin the study of chinese characters the average boy spent five years in the sho or primary school during the first year he began the study of the chinese classics the method of learning these books was to go through each one studying the sound only of each character a japanese lad must therefore know the sound of every character in the book before he had an idea of what a single one of them meant. This is as if an English boy attacking Homer or the Hebrew Bible were to learn to read the book through pronouncing every word carefully, but knowing nothing of its meaning or the construction of the language. But in case of the Japanese lad, he must learn nearly two thousand characters and several hundred sounds before receiving an explanation of their meaning. The books mastered as to sense and meaning during the years spent in the primary school were the small learning, the moral duties of man, Confucius's four books of moral, the three character book of morals, the book of filial duties, the book of great lineage, ancestry of the Mikado, and the entrance to knowledge, duties of cleanliness, obedience, etc. The scholar's work during the first year was with Kana and the sound of Chinese characters. In the second year the writing of Chinese characters was begun, and continued thenceforward as a never-ending part of his education. He learned to write the names of all the emperors, of all the large cities, provinces, and the geographical divisions of Japan, his own name and that of his family, the names of streets, familiar objects, the characters for points of the compass, the seasons, names of countries, of years, chronological era, etc., and to read and copy proclamations and edicts on the notice boards. During the third year, the Japanese lad learned the four rudimentary rules of arithmetic and the use of the abacus, a point at which the mathematical education of a vast majority of Japanese ended. He also read the Book of Heroes, a book containing biographies of model men and women, moral anecdotes, accounts of virtuous and noble actions, etc. The study of the Chinese classics was continued. Much time was spent in writing Chinese characters, and several hours a week were given to the practical study of etiquette, how to walk, to bow, to visit, to talk, etc. Examinations were held twice a year, at which the daimyo, or high officials, were present and delivered prizes to the most diligent and successful, who were then graduated into the chiu, or middle school. Hitherto, the education was moral and intellectual. In middle school, the physical education began. The course comprised three years, during which daily lessons either in fencing, wrestling or spear exercise, and a monthly practice on horseback under expert instructors were parts of the curriculum. It would be tedious to detail all the studies of the middle school, but in substance they were simply an advance on the line of studies in the small school. The lad reads The History of China, The Book of Rhetoric, A Brief History of Japan, and a large book on Japanese strategy containing remarkable feats in war, narratives of heroes, etc. They learned the various styles of Chinese learning, how to write official and private letters, both original and after models. In arithmetic they learned to count large numerical quantities, 
and to solve problems by the four fundamental rules. They studied the topography of Japan with considerable thoroughness and read an epitome on universal geography. In the Dai, or high school, the students spent more time in the gymnasium and on the riding course, becoming proficient in riding, wrestling, archery, fencing, long and short spear exercise, and in the various arts by which an unarmed man may defend his life and injure his enemy. And their reading now took a higher range, embracing well-known historical classics. In arithmetic, vulgar and decimal fractions, the rule of three, involution, evolution, and progression were taught. A little algebra was introduced into some of the schools, but only a small minority of students reached the maximum of mathematical studies presented above. In the Seido, or old Chinese college in Yedo, the course of literary study ranged somewhat higher, and original composition in Chinese was made a specialty. The usual time allotted for study in all the schools was six hours a day, from six to twelve a.m. in the summer, from eight a.m. to two p.m. in the spring and autumn, and from nine a.m. to three p.m. in the winter. No long vacation was given in summer, but regular holidays throughout the year were numerous, and at the beginning of the year the schools were closed for several weeks. In general, the disciplinary rules of the schools were strictly observed. Each scholar must wear a hakama, or trousers formally distinguishing the samurai. If late, he could not enter the school for that day. When once in, he was not allowed to leave till school was out. The rewards at the end of the year were pieces of silk, ink stones, brush pens, paper, silver coin, and the highest at the Chinese college in Yedo was a robe on which the crest of the shogun was embroidered, with the privilege of always wearing the garment in public. The most common punishments were confinement to the room or house, whipping in front of the leg or on the back, walking up and down for several hours with one of the small writing tables on the head, having the moksha burned on the forefinger, etc. Of the teachers, some taught only the sound of the characters, others the meaning of separate characters, Others were expounders or exegetes. Writing, arithmetic, and each athletic exercise were taught by special instructors. Few of the teachers made teaching their permanent work, and of the scholars, probably not more than a third completed the full course of studies. It was absolutely necessary, however, that the samurai should have been at least through the small school. Without this rudimentary education, he could not become a householder. End of section 118. This recording is in the public domain. Section 119 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in February 2018. The World's Story, Volume 1, China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 119. How to Learn Japanese, by Rev. M. L. Gordon, M.D. The young missionary starts to his field filled with enthusiasm, and elated by the thought of preaching Christ's salvation to those who have never heard the good news of God. He may not actually entertain the idea, so commonly heard at home, that his first work on landing will be to repeat the old, old story to the astonished but receptive natives as they kneel in homage at his feet. He may think of his lack of knowledge of the language as an obstacle to immediate preaching, but he has doubtless been encouraged to regard this obstacle as of a very temporary character and he indulges the pleasing hope that a few weeks, or a few months at the farthest, will find him speaking like a native. When he reaches his destination, however, his complacency receives a terrible shock. Geographically speaking, he is now near the people whom he hopes to teach, but as far as actual teaching is concerned, a broader ocean than the Pacific still rolls between him and them. As he listens to the shouts of the boatmen who crowd around his ship, or the chattering of the jinrikisha men while they draw lots for the privilege of carrying him to his hotel, he understands, as never before, why the Russians call foreigners the dumb, the speechless, and say even of modern English travellers, Look at these people, 
they make a noise but cannot speak and he is ready without further investigation to call the japanese barbarians in the sense that the greeks used the word barbaros that is as designating all who spoke a language unintelligible to themselves the language the language what an alpine barrier to all communication with the people he would teach there are it is true a few a gradually increasing number who understand english and eager for immediate results he may confine himself to these or he may use one of these english-speaking japanese as an interpreter in preaching to others with the american theological student who felt that he had a special call to labor among educated young ladies as a precedent why should he not choose some such restricted work or he may imitate the example of scotland's most famous missionary to the chinese who even before he reached his destination attempted to teach the doctrine of the atonement to the boatmen who came alongside the ship by going through the motions of washing a garment but if he be too wise to depend upon such imperfect methods unless he has gone there for some special work such as the teaching of english determine that even the alps shall not keep him out of italy and so procuring the best books on the subject and engaging the best available living teacher he will tackle the language in real earnest and this will seem but the beginning of his troubles if he secure a teacher who understands english he will find himself talking in english about the japanese language learning something of the science of the language perhaps but making little or no progress in the art of speaking it most probably he will be teaching ten times as much english to his teacher as he learns japanese from him on the other hand if he employs a teacher who knows no english the result will be two persons together in a room with no knowledge of each other's language and no means of communication except signs and the japanese english dictionary striving to see which can the sooner tire out and disgust the other our friend begins in a concrete way by inquiring the names of the most familiar things about the house using the one sentence given him by an older missionary kore wa nani tomoshimasu ka what is this in answer to his question he is told that the rice on the table is called meshi all vowels it should be remarked have the continental pronunciation rejoicing in this knowledge he begins making sentences i eat meshi the little child likes meshi no says his mentor in speaking of a child's rice it is better to use the word mama the child likes mama undiscouraged the student tries again do you eat meshi when his teacher stops him and tells him that it is polite in speaking to another of his having or eating rice to call it gozen having taken this in he goes on with his sentence building the merchant sells gozen when the teacher again calls a halt and tells him that meshi and gozen are used for cooked rice only and that for unboiled rice kome is the proper word feeling that he is now getting into the secrets of the language he says kome grows in the fields when he is again stopped with the information that growing rice is called ine he next picks up a carpenter's rule and is told that the foot measure is called shaku he is glad to find that it is just about twelve inches in length but is nonplussed when he learns that the tailor's shaku measures fifteen inches his perplexity increases on finding that when he sends for a kin pound of beef he gets five sixths of an avoir du poids pound if he sends for a kin of flour he gets one and one third pounds while if he purchase a kin of sugar it is within a small fraction of two pounds in starting on a journey he is told that one ri is equal to two and one half english miles but if in passing through certain districts he be puzzled because of the unexpectedly long distances he may be told that there it takes three and a half miles to make a ri on the other hand in ascending fuji and other mountains 
the traveller often finds that the real distance is only about one-half of that marked on the milestones, because, as he is gravely told, the ascent requires a double amount of exertion. He finds all of the provinces and some cities with two names each, and the country now divided into prefectures, with still different names, while, till very recently, the main island of Japan had no name whatever. Filled with dismay and despair at the confusion into which his teacher has introduced him, he turns for relief to the books on the language prepared by European scholars, and reads for his encouragement from the latest authority upon the subject such sentences as these. Japanese nouns have no gender or number, Japanese adjectives no degrees of comparison, Japanese verbs no persons. Strictly speaking, there are but two parts of speech. The prepositions are postpositions. Most sentences are subjectless. It is not that the subjects are dropped, but still understood as in other languages. They do not exist in the mind of the speaker. The Japanese language abhors pronouns. The verb is often omitted. The normal Japanese sentence is a paragraph. The order of the words is often the exact reverse of that in English. Thus, to give rice to a beggar would in Japanese be kojiki ni meshi wo yaru, beggar to rice give. Still further, the Japanese do not write as they speak, but use an antiquated and partially artificial dialect whenever they put pen to paper. End of section 119「Section 120 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The World Story, Volume 1 china japan and the islands of the pacific edited by eve march tappan section one hundred and twenty the attack upon port arthur by lieutenant tagigoshi sakurai of the imperial japanese army as soon as we were gathered together the colonel rose and gave us a final word of exhortation saying this battle is our great chance of serving our country to-night we must strike at the vitals of port arthur our brave assaulting column must be not simply a forlorn hope resolved to die but a sure death detachment i as your father am more grateful than i can express for your gallant fighting do your best all of you yes we were all ready for death when leaving japan men going to battle of course cannot expect to come back alive but in this particular battle to be ready for death was not enough what was required of us was a determination not to fail to die indeed we were sure death men and this new appellation gave us a great stimulus also a telegram that had come from the minister of war in tokyo was read by the aide-de-camp which said i pray for your success this increased the exultation of our spirits let me now recount the sublimity and horror of this general assault i was a mere lieutenant and everything passed through my mind as in a dream so my story must be something like picking out things from the dark i can't give you any systematic account but must limit myself to fragmentary recollections if this story sounds like a vainglorious account of my own achievements it is not because i am conscious of my merit when i have so little to boast of but because the things concerning me and near me are what i can tell you with authority 
if this partial account prove a clue from which the whole story of this terrible assault may be inferred my work will not have been in vain the men of the sure death detachment rose to their part fearlessly they stepped forward to the place of death they went over pan lung shan and made their way through the piled up bodies of the dead groups of five or six soldiers reaching the barricaded slope one after the other i said to the colonel good-bye then with this farewell i started and my first step was on the head of a corpse our objective points were the northern fortress and wang tai hill there was a fight with bombs at the enemy's skirmish trenches the bombs sent from our side exploded finely and the place became at once a conflagration boards were flung about sandbags burst heads flew around legs were torn off the flames mingled with the smoke lighted up our faces weirdly with a red glare and all at once the battle line became confused then the enemy thinking it hopeless left the place and began to flee forward forward now is the time to go forward forward pursue capture it with one bound and proud of our victory we went forward courageously captain kawakami raising his sword cried forward and then i standing close by him cried sakurai's company forward thus shouting i left the captain's side and in order to see the road we were to follow went behind the rampart what is that black object which obstructs our view it is the ramparts of the northern fortress looking back i did not see a soldier alack had the line been cut in trepidation keeping my body to the left for safety i called the twelfth company lieutenant sakurai a voice called out repeatedly in answer returning in the direction of the sound i found corporal ito weeping loudly what are you crying for what has happened the corporal weeping bitterly gripped my arm tightly lieutenant sakurai you have become an important person what is there to weep about i say what is the matter he whispered in my ear our captain is dead hearing this i too wept was it not only a moment ago that he had given the order forward was it not even now that i had separated from him and yet our captain was one of the dead in one moment our tender pitying captain kawakami and i had become beings of two separate worlds was it a dream or a reality i wondered corporal ito pointed out the captain's body which had fallen inside the rampart only a few rods away i hastened thither and raised him in my arms captain i could not say a word more but as matters could not remain thus i took the secret map which the captain had and rising up boldly called out from henceforward i command the twelfth company and i ordered that some one of the wounded should carry back the captain's corpse a wounded soldier was just about to raise it up when he was struck on a vital spot and died leaning on the captain one after another of the soldiers who took his place was struck and fell i called sub-lieutenant ninomiya and asked him if the sections were together he answered in the affirmative i ordered corporal ito not to let the line be cut and told him that i would be in the centre of the skirmishers in the darkness of the night we could not distinguish the features of the country nor in which direction we were to march standing up abruptly against the dark sky were the northern fortress and wang tai hill in front of us lay a natural stronghold and we were in a cauldron shaped hollow but still we marched on side by side the twelfth company forward i turned to the right 
and went forward as in a dream i remember nothing clearly of the time keep the line together this was my one command presently i ceased to hear the voice of corporal ito who had been at my right hand the bayonets gleaming in the darkness became fewer the black masses of soldiers who had pushed their way on now became a handful all at once as if struck by a club i fell down sprawling on the ground i was wounded struck in my right hand the splendid magnesium light of the enemy flashed out showing the piled up bodies of the dead and i raised my wounded hand and looked at it it was broken at the wrist the hand hung down and was bleeding profusely i took out the already loosened bundle of bandages footnote the first aid bandages prepared by the red cross society issued to every soldier as part of his equipment End footnote tied up my wound with a triangular piece and then wrapping my handkerchief over it i slung it from my neck with the sunrise flag which i had sworn to plant on the enemy's fortress looking up i saw that only a valley lay between me and wang tai hill which almost touched the sky i wished to drink and sought at my waist but the canteen was gone its leather strap alone was entangled in my feet the voices of the soldiers were lessening one by one in contrast the glare of the rockets of the hated enemy and the frightful noise of the cannonading increased i slowly rubbed my legs and seeing that they were unhurt i again rose throwing aside the sheath of my sword i carried the bare blade in my left hand as a staff went down the slope as in a dream and climbed wang tai hill the long and enormously heavy guns were towering before me and how few of my men were left alive now i shouted and told the survivors to follow me but few answered my call when i thought that the other detachments must also have been reduced to a similar condition my heart began to fail me no reinforcement was to be hoped for so i ordered a soldier to climb the rampart and plant the sun flag overhead but alas he was shot and killed without even a sound or cry all of a sudden a stupendous sound as from another world rose around about me counter assault a detachment of the enemy appeared on the rampart looking like a dark wooden barricade they surrounded us in the twinkling of an eye and raised a cry of triumph our disadvantageous position would not allow us to offer any resistance and our party was too small to fight them we had to fall back down the steep hill looking back i saw the russians shooting at us as they pursued when we reached the earthworks before mentioned we made a stand and faced the enemy great confusion and infernal butchery followed bayonets clashed against bayonets the enemy brought out machine-guns and poured shot upon us pell-mell the men on both sides fell like grass but i cannot give you a detailed account of the scene because i was then in a dazed condition i only remember that i was bandishing my sword in fury i also felt myself occasionally cutting down the enemy i remember a confused fight of white blade against white blade the rain and hail of shell a desperate fight here and a confused scuffle there at last i grew so hoarse that i could not shout any more suddenly my sword broke with a clash my left arm was pierced i fell and before i could rise a shell came and shattered my right leg i gathered all my strength and tried to stand up but i felt as if i were crumbling and fell to the ground perfectly powerless a soldier who saw me fall cried lieutenant sakurai let us die together 
i embraced him with my left arm and gnashing my teeth with regret and sorrow i could only watch the hand-to-hand -hand fight going on about me my mind worked like that of a madman but my body would not move an inch end of section 120 the recording is in the public domain section 121 of china japan and the islands of the pacific read for librivox.org by sarah hale japan part 5 little stories of japan historical note the art and literature of japan date from about the 5th century a.d books on history philosophy and kindred subjects were written in the chinese language poetry plays and fiction in japanese daily newspapers were unknown in japan until 1871 at first they suffered much inconvenience from the government's habit of imprisoning editors whose views did not meet with its approval but this difficulty was finally overcome by hiring dummy editors whose sole duties were to go to jail in the realm of decorative art the japanese are unsurpassed unlike the artists of the western world the japanese do not attempt to copy the object painted but to set down their impression of it end of section 121 this recording is in the public domain. Section 122 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by April 6090, California, United States of America. Japanese Politeness by Mortimer Menpes. One of the most remarkable illustrations of the native politeness that I have ever witnessed is in Tokyo. A man pulling along a cart loaded high with boughs of trees chanced to catch the roof of a coolie's house in one of his pieces of timber, tearing away a large portion of it, for a roof is a very slim affair in Japan. The owner of the house rushed out thoroughly upset and began to expostulate and to explain how very distressing it was to have one's roof torn off in this manner. No doubt, if he had been a Britisher, he would have used quaint language, but there are no swear words in the Japanese language. They are too polite a people. The abused one stood calmly, with arms folded, listening to the harangue, and saying nothing. Only when the enraged man had finished, he pointed to the towel, which in his haste the coolie had forgotten to take off his head. At once the coolie realized the enormity of his offense. Both hands flew to the towel and tore it off in confusion. The coolie bowing to the ground and offering humble apologies for having presumed to appear without uncovering his head. For in Japan, one must always uncover, whether to a sweep or to a mikado. The two parted the best of friends. One had been impolite enough to forget to uncover, the other had torn away a roof. The rudeness of the one balanced the injury of the other. Thus are the offenses weighed in Japan. End of section 122 this recording is in the public domain. Section 123 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Eva Davis. How the Shopkeeper Lost His Cue by Lafcadio Hearn. An old shopkeeper who sells us lacquerware had a cue, like not a few other old shopkeepers in Kumamoto. He professed to detest all Western manners, dress, ideas, and praise the tempora antiqua without stint, whereby he offended young Japan and his business diminished. It continued to diminish. His young wife lamented and begged him to cut off his cue. He replied that he would suffer any torment rather than that. Business became slacker. Landlord came round for rent. All three were samurai husband was out landlord said if your husband would cut off his cue he might be able to pay his rent 
that is just what i tell him said she but he won't listen to me let me talk to him said the landlord q comes in out of breath and salutes landlord landlord frowns and asks for rent usual apologies then you get out of my house says the landlord get out at once q cannot understand old friend's sudden harshness becomes humble and vain makes offer of his stock in payment landlord says hm what anything you like in the shop hm word of honour yes landlord joyfully to wife bring me a scissors quick scissors is brought dismay and protests checked by the terrible word yakusoku off goes the queue owner mourns landlord laughs and says old friend i make you now a present of the three months rent you owe me nothing business begins to improve end of section 123 this recording is in the public domain Section 124 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Avai. Fujiyama. Photograph, page 462. The sacred mountain of Japan is thus described by Mrs. Hugh Fraser. There is one more name besides those which I have enumerated and to my mind it is the most poetic of all the titles of fujisan the buddhists call it the peak of the white lotus to them the snow-crowned mountain rising in unsullied purity from the low hills around it was the symbol of the white lotus whose foot grows green under its wide leaves in the stagnant water while its cup of breathless white holds up its golden heart its jewel to the sky and the wonderful symmetry of the mountain with its eight-sided crater reminded them of the eight-petalled lotus which forms the seat of the glorified buddha in the more learned odes the mountain is called fuyo ho the lotus peak and the buddhists say that the great teacher buddha himself gave it this perfect shape the symbol of nirvana's perfect peace so the queen of mountains hangs between the stars of heaven and the mists of earth dear to every heart that can be still and understand as i said once before fuji dominates life here by its silent beauty sorrow is hushed longing quieted strife forgotten in its presence and broad rivers of peace seem to flow down from that changeless home of peace the peak of the white lotus End of section 124. This recording is in the public domain. Section 125 of China, Japan, and the Islands of the Pacific. Read for LibriVox.org by Nima. The Cherry Tree of the Sixteenth Day by Lafcadio Hearn. In Wakagori, a district of the province of Io, there is a very ancient and famous cherry tree called Jurokuzakura, or the cherry tree of the sixteenth day, because it blooms every year upon the sixteenth day of the first month by the old lunar calendar, and only upon that day. Thus, the time of its flowering is the period of great cold, though the natural habit of a cherry tree is to wait for the spring season before venturing to blossom but the jurokuzakura blossoms with a life that is not or at least was not originally its own there is the ghost of a man in that tree he was a samurai of io and the tree grew in his garden and it used to flower at the usual time that is to say about the end of march or the beginning of april he had played under that tree when he was a child and his parents and grandparents and ancestors had hung to its blossoming branches season after season for more than a hundred years bright strips of colored paper inscribed with poems of praise 
he himself became very old outliving all his children and there was nothing in the world left for him to love except that tree and lo in the summer of a certain year the tree withered and died exceedingly the old man sorrowed for his tree then kind neighbors found for him a young and beautiful cherry tree and planted it in his garden hoping thus to comfort him and he thanked them and pretended to be glad but really his heart was full of pain for he had loved the old tree so well that nothing could have consoled him for the loss of it at last there came to him a happy thought he remembered a way by which the perishing tree might be saved it was the sixteenth of the first month alone he went into his garden and bowed down before the withered tree and spoke to it saying now deign i beseech you once more to bloom because i am going to die in your stead for it is believed that one can really give away one's life to another person or to a creature or even to a tree by the favor of the gods and thus to transfer one's life is expressed by the term migawari nai tatsu to act as a substitute then under that tree he spread a white cloth in divers coverings and sat down upon the coverings and performed harikari after the fashion of a samurai and the ghost of him went into the tree and made it blossom in that same hour and every year it still blooms on the sixteenth day of the first month in the season of snow end of section one hundred and twenty five this recording is in the public domain